The scripture this morning is from Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14 from the message. Hear the story of Ezekiel hearing the word of God and witnessing God bring to life what once was dead. God grabbed me. God's spirit took me up and set me down in the middle of an open plain strewn with bones. He led me around and among them a lot of bones. There were bones all over the plain, dry bones bleached by the sun. Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Master God, only you know that. Prophesy over these bones, dry bones. Listen to the message of God. God the Master told the dry bones, watch this. I'm bringing the breath of life to you and you'll come to life. I'll attach sinews to you. Put meat on your bones. Cover you with skin and breathe life into you. You'll come alive and you'll realize that I am God. I prophesied just as I'd been commanded. As I prophesied, there was a sound and, oh, rustling. Bones moved and came together, bone to bone. I kept watching. Sinews formed, then muscles on them, and then skin stretched over them. But they had no breath in them. God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man. Tell the breath, God the master says, come for winds. Come, breathe, breathe on those slain bodies. Bring life. So I prophesied just as God commanded me. The breath entered them and they came alive. They stood on their feet, a huge army. Then God said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Listen to what they are saying. Our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There's nothing left of us. Therefore prophesy, I'll dig up your graves and bring you out alive, oh my people. And then I'll take you straight to the land of Israel. When I dig up graves and bring you out as my people, you'll realize that I am God. I'll breathe my life into you and you will live. Then I'll lead you straight back to your land and you will realize that I am God. I have said it and I'll do it. The word of God for the people of God. I have a confession to make. For a period of time in my life, well, for 12 years to be exact, I saw dead people. As soon as I woke up in the morning, I saw dead people. And in fact, every time I looked out my living room window, I saw dead people. It wasn't like that kid in the sixth sense. I saw dead people because for 12 years, Robin and I lived in Colma, California, which has a population of, 12 mil, of 1 million dead people and 1,200 living people. Let me explain. In 1860s, San Francisco was growing by leaps and bounds due to the gold rush. Why city planners realized that if they kept burying the dead within city limits, they'd run out of precious space on that peninsula. So in the 1900, in 1900, the city 
bought a 2.2 square mile plot of land just south of the city, exhumed all the bodies of all those who had been buried, moved them down to Colma, and banned all further burials within city limits. Today, Colma has 17 different cemeteries, including four Jewish cemeteries, the country's only Greek Orthodox cemetery, two Chinese cemeteries, as well as Italian, Japanese, Serbian, and paupers burial grounds. There's also a pet cemetery <laughs> where it is rumored that Tina Turner's dog is resting six feet under, wrapped in one of her fur coats. Personally, being from New York, I loved being able to say that I lived across the street from Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> we in Colma were never very far from the dead. So that's why when you moved to Colma, you got a bumper sticker that reads, it's great to be alive in Colma. <laughs> Living in a town of so much death causes this scripture to resonate with me. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts be led by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, as bizarre as the imagery of the dry bones is, I know something about that, and it's more than just because I lived in Colma. As a bishop of the church who has been a pastor for almost two-thirds of her life, one who has vowed to hold God's people in my heart, I know what it's like to walk amidst the valley of the dry bones, for it is one of the tasks of being a pastor. Over the years, many of my pastors and colleagues have revealed to me their dry bones, while many more of you probably don't realize how much of your dry bones are showing. But I see them. And my heart aches for you, for I too know what it's like to have dry bones to be in that valley. And I find great hope and comfort in this vision that Ezekiel had, not only of the dry bones, but of what God can do with them, how they can be reconnected, how, how flesh can be restored and strength regained by the word and breath of God. Until these dry, old, dry bones can stand on their own two feet again. As new pastors and as seasoned pastors, as longtime lay leaders and folks who are new to faith, I hope you too find great comfort and hope in this, how God's spirit can provide restoration when we are feeling most dried up, of hope when we are most in despair and, when new, and find new life when death seems all around us. If the prophet Ezekiel was carried by the Holy Spirit out of his time and place and dropped in the middle of the United Methodist Church on June 10th, 2018, what would he see? To get even more specific, if he found himself in the middle of the Mountain Sky Conference of the United Methodist Church, what would he find? If he found himself in, in your community, in your church, what would he find? Would he wonder if he was once again dropped in the middle of the Valley of the Dry Bones? Now, it's more than just this terrible water drought that makes me wonder if I am living in a desert and surrounded by dry bones because death is a constant figure looming around us. The other day, I was walking briskly to an appointment when I passed a, a small impromptu shrine on a street corner. It's dying flowers marking the place where a person took his or her last breath, pedestrian or gunshot. And what shocked me most of all was how easily that thought passed through my head. No horror, no disbelief. 
every day. We learn of one more casualty in the war on black and brown bodies that's being waged in our country. We hear of more deaths in the Middle East, more deaths due to drug overdoses in towns across our area, more families being separated by a flawed immigration policy, another school shooting, dry bones and death are everywhere. And there's another death we're experiencing, and it is the death of civility. You know, road rage has turned our highways into turf wars. I was driving home one day and saw two cars stopped in the middle of the fast lane. One man got out of his car with a baseball bat and started to pummel the car behind him. There is death on our highways, in our supermarkets, in our city streets, and on social media, as we seem to have forgotten how we how to interact with each other in generous and gracious ways. There is even death in this place that's supposed to be most life-affirming, the Christian church. For many people in the United States, the church is irrelevant and outdated, woefully out of touch with the needs and concerns of our day and age. The church has forgotten that it exists to do one thing and one thing excellently, to share God's love found in Christ Jesus with the world. This life-affirming word has been replaced with ashes and dust of crushed bones as we fight amongst ourselves. We know every single one of us knows what it means to be in the midst of the valley of dry bones. Death surrounds us, our neighborhoods, our world, main streets throughout our region are Often boarded up, young people move away. Family farms and ranches are in financial distress. Even if you think you're personally excused from death, ask any scientist how the levels of pollution in our air and water are shortening your life. The Spirit said to Ezekiel, these bones say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is gone. There is nothing left of us. We echo those bones in the valley of death. We too cry out that our lives are dried up. Our hope is lost. There is nothing left of us. Life feels hopeless. Death seems to have the upper hand. So how do we cope? What do we do when feelings of depression, fear, rage, when we feel the pain of living in a world where death is all too present? Oh, people of the Mountain Sky Conference, we are to stand as the prophet Ezekiel right in the middle of the valley of the dry bones. We must look with open eyes at the rubble around us. We must stand unflinchingly, not distracting ourselves by overworking or by our addictions. We must survey the scene and not divert our eyes as we listen for the Spirit of God to ask us, oh mortal one, can these bones Bones live. Oh, oh woman, can these bones live? Oh man, can these bones live? New pastors, this is the life to which you have been called. Lay leaders, this is what God asks of you. If we trust in God, through our rage and through our hurt and through it and our tears, we will answer, oh God, only you know that. And God will say, watch. Watch. I am bringing the breath of life to you and you will come to life. You'll come alive and realize that I am God. So look around at our world. Can this nation live? Can our earth live? Can our beloved United Methodist Church live? Oh God, only you know that. Can we learn to get 
angry and rage and admit our woundedness and fear and cry, not alone but together. Oh, God, only you know that. I'll dig up your graves, God says. I will bring you out alive, oh, my people. I will breathe life in you and you will live. Just as the tomb could not hold Jesus, but the stone got rolled away because death holds no candle to resurrection, so too this resurrection power is available to us all. God calls us from death to life. God desires to breathe life into our world, our nation, our church, our relationships. There's a whole lot of shaking going on. Death has held us in its grasp for too long, but no more, O oh death. So can these bones live? The dead, dry bones of peace, of beauty, of wholeness, of reconciliation, of forgiveness are stirring, coming back to life. Can you hear the rattling? Can you feel the connections being made? One life connected to another life, held together by sinews of love and mutuality. Can these bones live? Can you feel the breath of life moving in through and through you and through our city streets, our fields, our relationships? Can you feel the surging of life reawakening church communities that are gripped by death's slumber? Can you feel new life coming into dead and dried out relationships? The bones continue to rattle, to join together, to connect once again. Can these bones live? These all dried up, achy bones are rising up, reaching for justice, reaching for recovery, reaching for right relationships. The bones continue to rattle and call you into connection. Can these bones live? As disciples of Jesus, can you bring the gospel's good news to those who are hungry for a word of hope? Will you be an agent of God's saving work? Will you walk with Christ into the very places that stink of death so that love's redeeming work can occur? Can these bones live? God is calling us to be the new Ezekiels, to allow God's spirit to breathe anew in our world, to restore hope in the hearts of bone-weary people, to roll up out of death's clutches and be bearers of life and light to the world. Will you help these bones live again? Will you allow God to work through you so that new life can be offered? Will you dare to preach the good news of Jesus Christ in the very face of death? So shake, rattle, and roll these bones to new life so that the world can shrug off death's grip and justice, hope, love, and peace may live in the hearts and minds of all people. redeemed of the Lord say so every praise every praise put your hands together
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.